Hi everyone, in this lecture I'm going to talk about the uh, second and last part of uh, chapter 7, Multimedia Networking. In this lecture I'm going to go over uh, voice over IP and uh, the techniques that is used for such application and also uh, in section 7.5 I'll talk about network support for multimedia. Voice over IP means uh, we transfer uh, audio over uh, IP protocol. So uh, the most important requirement and constraint in such application is that we need to maintain the conversational aspect of uh, the application, which means that uh, if high de uh, if uh, delays are noticeable, then uh, uh, the uh, the users of such application cannot interact properly. Therefore, the delay of uh, less than 150 milliseconds is considered to be a uh, be an appropriate delay for such application. However, if the delay is more than 400 milliseconds, then uh, the application doesn't work properly for the uh, end users and uh, we have to uh, take this important constraint into account when uh, designing such application. Another challenge of this application is that uh, we need to know how Kali can advertise uh, his or her IP address and port number and how uh, the end systems of uh, or the end users of the application can agree on the encoding algorithm. Also, there are some services that will be uh, that should be added to uh, the main application. For example, uh, call forwarding, screening, and recording on the, are the services that are expected to exist in such applications. And of course, emergency services. In order to know the characteristics of UIP, we first need to know how a speaker works. A speaker doesn't continuously send audio signals. Uh, in fact, we have some alternating sequence of talk spurts and silence period. For example, in a very short time period, uh, in a very short time slot, uh, the speaker uh, sends some talk spurts and then for another period, uh, we have a silence. Again, we have talk spurt, after that, uh, we have silence. During the talk experts, uh, the speaker plays an audio that can be uh, recorded by a bitrate of uh, 64 kilobit per second. Assuming that the length of each talk expert is 20 milliseconds, you can calculate that uh, at each talk expert, uh, we have to have uh, 160 bytes of data. To calculate this 160 bytes of data, all you need to do is to multiply uh, 20 millisecond by 64 kilobit per second, which is the uh, bit rate. This 160 bytes of uh, audio data uh, will be added to the application layer header and then it, the, it, the, the whole thing is encapsulated into UDP or TCP segment and is transferred through the network. As uh, we have seen before, the network is not perfect and you know, uh, it, you may have some network loss, an IP datagram can be lost uh, due to network congestion. Also, we can have uh, a significant delay uh, for transferring an IP datagram. In fact, uh, VOIP is an application that cannot tolerate more than uh, 400 milliseconds of delay. If we have more than this uh, much delay, then uh, the packet is also considered as a lost packet. Depending on voice encoding, usually uh, the applications, VOIP applications, uh, can tolerate a loss rate between 1% and 10%. In order to understand how voice over IP works, let's consider this simplified scenario. 
in this scenario as you see we have a plot uh, we have three plots of uh, cumulative data over time the time is the horizontal line and cumulative data is the vertical line as you see we have a constant uh, bit rate of transmission uh, in this uh, plot you can see that uh, we have some time uh, we have some talk experts which are shown with the vertical line and some silence period which are shown by uh, horizontal lines in the horizontal lines there's uh, no change in cumulative data which means we have silent periods and then in the vertical lines uh, we have a spurt of uh, data a talk spurt the second plot, uh, which is shown with a black color, uh, is the plot of uh, client uh, data reception. Uh, as you see, uh, the client receives uh, the sent data by the other uh, side of the connection uh, in a variable network delay. So sometimes, uh, like uh, this packet, uh, we have a smaller or shorter delay sometimes like this uh, talk expert we have a long uh, delay after client receives the data in this plot we have another plot which is shown with a blue color uh, in the plot with blue color you see a constant pitch rate of playout a client the reason that the playout rate is constant is not, and it's not uh, variable is because uh, the client wants to hear the voice in the same way that the voice was recorded initially. So uh, the red and blue plot have the same pattern. In order to absorb the variability of network delay in this uh, black plot, uh, we have to have some uh, playout delay which you see here this is the length of playout delay uh, which means after the first packet is received here we have to wait uh, for some uh, maybe one or two seconds before playing out uh, the audio for the client uh, this will help uh, uh, to absorb the uh, variability of network and allows us to have a constant pitch rate play out at client of course uh, the client has to have some buffer so that for example at this point in time uh, since the client has received uh, more data than the data that has already been played out uh, the client can buffer that data and play it out later in the next uh, time periods the reason that i told you that in the previous slide we have a simplified scenario is because uh, the playout delay in the previous slide was fixed which means that uh, no matter what the network delay is we always uh, play uh, play out the audio in the client side exactly q millisecond after the chunk was generated on the other side of the network Therefore, if the chunk of data has timestamp T, the playout time for that chunk should be T plus Q, and Q is not a function of time. It's not variable, it's a constant value. And Q is the playout delay that I mentioned in the previous slide. So there are a trade -off, there's a trade-off in choosing the value of Q. If you choose a large values for a Q, Obviously, we have less packet loss because we allow uh, more variability for network delay and we can tolerate more uh, network delay. However, if we have a smaller queue, uh, we, we will have a better interactive experience for the client and this will help uh, to improve the quality of service provided by VOIP applications. Here you can see two different playout delays uh, for the fixed playout delay of VOIP. Uh, this black line and the uh, pink dots uh, show how uh, the playout is scheduled for each to talk expert. As you see here, we have a, a small, a relatively a small um, 
play out delay however this second line with these uh, you know, pink dots on it show uh, a playout schedule uh, for a larger uh, playout delay. As you see, if we schedule uh, the playouts on this line, then you will have no packet loss if uh, the packet if the packets are received in this uh, format that you see in the red plot. However, if we have uh, these schedules on this line, since the playout delay is shorter, we have uh, at least one packet loss here. Why? Because the packet will arrive later than the playout time schedule. So the packet is considered to be lost. So as I said before, uh, there's a trade-off of choosing the playout delay. If we choose it uh, smaller, we may have the higher probability of a packet loss. However, if we choose it uh, larger, uh, like the one that you see in this line, then the problem that can raise is that uh, the, the clients may experience uh, not a very interactive uh, application and, you know, the, the client has to wait uh, three four to five seconds, for example, uh, to hear uh, the voice of the user on the other side of the line. A more complicated way of uh, implementing uh, voice over IP application is to consider uh, adaptive playout delay instead of constant playout delay. The goal uh, for such complication is to lower down the playout delay uh, for the quality purposes and then uh, lower down the uh, late loss rate uh, for the uh, for a more tolerable uh, application to network delay to reach to these two goals uh, the adaptive playout delay uh, version of uh, voice over ip applications uh, do the following. First, uh, they estimate the network delay and based on the value of estimated network delay, they decide uh, what the playout delay must be and you know, based on the network delay, they adjust the playout delay. How can they adjust the playout delay? By either compressing or elongating the silence periods. For example, if the estimated network delay is very long, uh, we have to shorten the silence period in order to, you know, compensate the network, the large network delay. However, if the network delay is pretty small, then we have to elongate the silence period so that we can uh, have talk per scheduled uh, in a constant rate. In order to estimate the packet delay, we use the same method that we use for estimating uh, TCP RTT value. So it is called exponentially weighted moving average. Basically, uh, the estimated delay at time i uh, would be the weighted average of uh, the historical delay, which is di minus one, plus uh, the weighted average of uh, the di minus one, which is the historical average, historical delay, and the current uh, delay that is observed at the network. Why r i minus t i is the observed delay? Because t i represents the timestamp of the packet, and r i represents uh, the time that is received by the client. So r i minus t i is called is equal to the delay so that should be multiplied by alpha which is a number between 0 and 1 usually 1 over 4 or uh, 1 over 8 and then uh, the weight of uh, the historical delay is 1 minus alpha so for example if alpha is 1 over 4 then uh, the weight of uh, historical delay should be 70, uh, 0.75 in a similar way that we estimate uh, di we can also estimate uh, the average deviation of delay 
that is also very helpful basically we are estimating the standard deviation of uh, di which i represented uh, which i represent here with uh, vi so basically vi is also equal to uh, 1 minus beta times vi minus 1 plus beta times the observed uh, deviation of delay so uh, what is beta beta again it's a number between 0 and 1 for example 1 over 8 and uh, vi minus 1 is the historical delay so it's a weighted average between the historical delay and uh, you know the observed delay why this uh, absolute value is the observed uh, deviation of delay because uh, ri minus ti as i said before it's the observed delay minus ti which is the estimated delay so this uh, the subtraction i mean the difference between uh, the estimated delay and the observed delay would be the observed deviation of delay at time i and then basically using this um, exponentially weighted moving average approach we can uh, estimate the average deviation of delay and uh, since we estimated both delay and its deviation we can uh, say di plus k times vi uh, is a good upper hand estimation of the delay uh, with uh, uh, with a good confidence ratio if we select k uh, equal to 2 or 3 for example if you remember for tcp rtt uh, the k was the value of k was around 4 because we needed more than 99% uh, confidence uh, but now here you don't need that much uh, confidence ratio you so you can just set k equal to 2 and then you're almost sure that uh, with a good 95 plus uh, probability di plus k times vi is uh, an upper bound for uh, network delay with the value of uh, upper bound of uh, delay network delay we can uh, create an equation uh, between the playout time uh, and uh, ti the time stamp of the packet and then you know we can basically know uh, what should be the difference between the playout time the and the time stamp and uh, this uh, difference can help us to either elongate uh, the silence period or make it uh, shorter and uh, basically this is the whole idea of adaptive playout delay which helps us uh, to absorb the variability of uh, network delay in a voice over IP application and have a uh, low playout rate uh, for the application which increases the quality of uh, application since we are manipulating the length of uh, silence periods in uh, this adaptive playout delay approach uh, there is a challenge for the receiver uh, in such applications and the challenge is the receiver doesn't know how to determine whether packet is uh, first in a talk expert so the the receiver is not sure about the order of packets which one should be uh, play out played out uh, uh, first by the speaker so in order to uh, have a order or determine the order of packets uh, it's not only enough to just check the stamps and uh, find the difference between successive stamps and for example if the difference is greater than 20 milliseconds we say uh, this uh, packet is uh, uh, um, uh, should be placed uh, this packet should be placed before or after another packet this is not enough for ordering uh, the receive packets another uh, you know another um, techniques that they use is to uh, uh, implement some sequence numbers for every packet and uh, similar to what we did for tcp uh, you can have sequence numbers to make sure that the 
uh, packets are uh, delivered in the same order that they are generated or you can say the packets are um, played out in the same order that they were originated by the sender. Another challenge in voice over IP applications is that uh, how we can recover from packet loss um, assuming that you know we have a very small tolerable uh, delay between original transmission and playout. If we use the technique that TCP uses, for example, using acknowledgement packets and uh, not acknowledgement packets, ACNAX packets, then uh, it's a very, very slow approach for this kind of application that are real time application. Uh, so uh, each ACNAX takes one RTT and that's very slow and it doesn't work for uh, the multimedia networking. Therefore, uh, there should be an alternative solution. The alternative solution that we talk about it in this uh, lecture is forward error correction, FEC. Uh, this is more like a error correction method, not an error detection method. Basically, uh, there are multiple uh, variations of such uh, approach but uh, in a very simple one, uh, you can consider simple FEC, simple forward error correction, uh, in which you send uh, not only the end chunks of uh, information that you have, but another extra N plus one chunk, uh, which is obtained by XORing all the N original chunks. So when you want to send, for example, 10 packets, you XOR all the packets, and then we create the 11th packet by XORing uh, the 10th, uh, the 10 original packets, and then send 11 packets instead of 10 packets. So what's the benefit of having one redundant chunk by exclusive ORing the N original uh, chunks? The benefit is that uh, basically if one chunk is lost, you can find that lost chunk by XORing the other 10 chunks that have been received without error. However, uh, there's a pro I mean, it's not the best uh, uh, idea to do so because, uh, for example, uh, if you have 10 chunks, you have to send uh, 11 uh, uh, chunks to the uh, to the other side of the line and basically you have to waste 10% uh, of your bandwidth by uh, sending redundant data. There, there are some other approaches that are more complicated than simple FEC and don't waste uh, the bandwidth as much as F simple FEC. Another approach is uh, to use piggyback lower quality stream. Uh, in this approach, if you are going to send these four chunks of data, uh, what you need to do is uh, create a lower quality copy of the first one and uh, add it to the second packet and create a lower quality of the second one and add it to the third packet, and create a lower quality of the third one, add it to the fourth packet. And then when you want to send uh, these four uh, chunks of data to the uh, client, uh, to the other side of the line, you're basically sending uh, these redundant uh, uh, packets to the um, client uh, to, the, uh, to the other side of the line and in the receiving side uh, if for example we have a packet loss for example the third packet is lost uh, you can uh, recover from this packet loss by copying uh, the you know the, the lower quality copies of uh, the third packet that you have in the fourth packet uh, instead of the uh, third packet and then uh, this will reconstruct the stream uh, however the third packet is not as 
uh, high quality as it was in the receiving and in the sending side, but at least uh, we are recovering from a whole packet loss by uh, replacing it with a lower quality uh, packet. So this uh, approach works if we have non-consecutive losses. If, for example, both three and four are lost, then you have no way of uh, reconstructing the stream because packet three cannot be reconstructed uh, because its copy, its lower quality copy is, uh, was in packet four and packet four is also uh, lost. So it's not the best idea, but again, uh, it's another idea that uh, can be used for uh, doing error correction with, uh, in a real time application, as I said. Acknowledge and uh, ACK and MAX obviously won't work for uh, a real time uh, multimedia application like uh, Voice over IP. Here you can see an improved version of the previous approach. Uh, basically, uh, if you have these, uh, the, the four chunks that I showed you in the previous slide, uh, you can uh, divide each of those chunks into four other uh, pieces. So this one is divided into four pieces, this one is divided into four pieces, and each piece have equal size. And then uh, before sending this original string to the receiving side, uh, we do uh, shuffle them. Like in this example, we have 16 uh, pieces of information uh, that are uh, that are spread out uh, that are uh, in the four original uh, chunks of data. So these 16 pieces of data uh, will be shuffled in the sending side, and as you see here, uh, the shuffle the stream is uh, you know transferred. Uh, to the other side of the network, to the other side of the, the connection. And uh, in the receiving side, uh, the receiver has to reconstruct the stream. However, for example, if you have lost one packet like this one, it's not a big deal because uh, this uh, last packet contained uh, the chunks number three, seven, 11, and 15. And each of these chunks belong to uh, each of these chunks belongs to uh, one of the four original uh, chunks of data so uh, each piece belongs to one different uh, packet in the original uh, stream therefore when you reconstruct the stream uh, you have in this example you have 75 percent of uh, the original data and you only miss one small piece from each of the packets and that a small piece uh, doesn't really affect your quality because you know when you have uh, uh, most of a packet uh, received without any error um, you can play it out and you know the receiver which is a human cannot really recognize the last part of that packet because of uh, uh, the way that our ears uh, work you know usually i mean they don't i mean the ear really don't uh, recognize a small loss in a big packet as an example of voice over ip applications you can consider skype Skype is a peer-to-peer -peer application. However, uh, it uses a client-server uh, architecture for the purpose of uh, authenticating the users uh, when they are logging in. So we have a, a Skype login server uh, which authenticates uh, users of Skype. But other than that, for the purpose of uh, communicating and uh, uh, transferring uh, uh, you know, multimedia packets, uh, Skype uses a, a two-layer peer-to-peer, uh, you know, architecture. Why do I say it's a two-layer architecture? Because not all the nodes are the same. 
uh, we have a higher layer which contains um, super nodes as you see here uh, these super nodes will create an overlay network like this is an overlay network in a skype and usually the super nodes are um, responsible for uh, introducing other nodes to each other by giving uh, them each other's ip addresses and then after uh, two normal nodes have uh, each other's ip address they can directly communicate without the help of the super nodes here you can see uh, the detailed process of uh, cl Skype client operation. As I said, uh, login is done uh, in a uh, client server uh, fashion, and uh, you know for IP addresses, super node play an um, important role. And after uh, two normal Skype nodes have uh, each other's IP addresses, they can initiate a call directly. Uh, a challenge that uh, Skype has to tackle is that sometimes the Skype uh, nodes, the Skype users are in are behind NATs, network address translation uh, routers, and in such scenarios, uh, if they know each other's IP address, that doesn't work because their IP address are not their real IP address because uh, they are behind NATs. So the solution is to uh, commun uh, the solution is that in these cases they have to communicate indirectly with the help of two super node, uh, two Skype super nodes. Uh, basically, uh, in this uh, figure, Bob uh, forwards the message to the Skype super node, and the Skype super node close to Bob sends uh, the information to the Skype super node near Alice using the overlay network and the skype super node near alice uh, will forward the message to alice and this process can also be uh, performed in the other direction from alice to bob and this way uh, they can um, you know co communicate in skype although they are behind nets the last part of this chapter is about network support for multimedia we'll see different network supports for multimedia basically you can divide uh, the network support into three different classes uh, the first class which is uh, the least complicated one is making best of best effort service uh, for multimedia networking and the second one is differentiated service which uh, create uh, different traffic classes and for each class the network provides different service and then we have uh, the most complicated approach which is per connection quality of service uh, which I really don't go through the last one uh, that much in this uh, lecture one of the simplest ideas for supporting a multimedia network is to deploy enough link capacity so that congestion doesn't occur and multimedia applications who are very very sensitive to uh, low bandwidth and uh, network delay uh, can enjoy a, a high capacity network uh, however the problem with this uh, idea is uh, we don't know how much bandwidth bandwidth is enough and uh, estimating network traffic demand uh, needs a lot of effort a more complicated approach uh, for uh, supporting multimedia networks is to uh, you know differentiate between different uh, uh, traffic uh, flows and uh, for example uh, partition traffic into multiple classes and each class can uh, uh, be treated by network in a different way as a human analogy you can consider uh, vip service versus regular service uh, since we have uh, you know the same way that we have two different services for uh, you know humans we can have different services for uh, different classes of traffic and uh, this way you can uh, give more bandwidth to the application that you think are 
uh, more important or uh, they need uh, immediate attention and they need uh, enough bandwidth to uh, operate normally. As an example, you can consider this scenario in which uh, there are four computers, four end systems. These two are two sides of a connection, the blue connection, and these two are uh, two sides of another connection, the, the red uh, uh, line, and both blue and red connections uh, share the same uh, link or the share uh, or share the same set of links share the same uh, path in such network topology if we assume that uh, one connection is uh, taking care of a uh, internet telephony and then the other uh, connection and is taking care of an HTTP uh, uh, application uh, for example uh, one side is client the other side is a web server which uh, communicates with the client over HTTP, TCP, and IP protocol. Uh, usually, in, in such scenario, uh, the internet telephony just needs a little bit of uh, bandwidth, but uh, the internet telephony is a time sensitive application, so it needs to have a minimum bandwidth at all times so that you know the internet telephony uh, service doesn't uh, get interrupted because of uh, uh, you know low bandwidth however uh, you know HTTP connection is a much more tolerable to network delay uh, so in this scenario if HTTP uh, uses a lot of uh, bandwidth for sending uh, a huge amount of uh, data from uh, uh, server to the client then uh, the internet telephony uh, connection uh, will starve and cannot uh, do its job in such scenario we have to uh, give some priority higher priority to the audio over http uh, and this needs, uh, uh, you know, a technique that we call it packet marking, uh, so that uh, you know the, the packets that are uh, used for uh, internet telephony are marked, uh, so that the routers can distinguish between different classes, between you know HTTP packets and uh, audio packets from the internet telephony uh, application. And uh, basically, a router can uh, treat packets accordingly. If the uh, packet is from uh, HTTP, uh, it doesn't immediately go through and let uh, packets from uh, the other service that has higher priority to go um, first. But packet marking alone is not enough for uh, deploying such approach because some applications may misbehave and uh, you know abuse uh, packet marking and uh, falsely claim that they are uh, sending uh, you know packets for a sensitive application but in reality they may not and encapsulate uh, other packets into a frame that looks like it's coming from a um, highly sensitive application and you know this way they can deceive um, the router so that they can get more bandwidth from the router so there should be a policing uh, at the uh, you know at the network edges so that uh, we can make sure that uh, we have genuine uh, end systems running genuine application and they're not cheating also another challenge of this technique is that uh, sometimes allocating uh, fixed non-shareable bandwidth uh, to a flow uh, may cause uh, inefficient uh, uh, performance of the network because that connection or that uh, uh, specific application may not use uh, the, the, uh, the 
allocated bandwidth at all times and uh, this would lower down the performance of the network a more flexible way of uh, supporting uh, multimedia networking is to have a scheduling policy uh, to choose uh, which packets should be uh, sent first on the link and to uh, find an order uh, for uh, the packets to be sent through the uh, through a connection through a link in a network uh, the simplest policy is first in first out which basically sends uh, packets in the order they have been arrived to the queue of a for example router also the queue has to have some discard policy for example if a packet arrives uh, to a queue and the queue is full uh, there are multiple options that we may choose based on uh, the way that we want uh, our network to um, perform uh, what pol one policy one discard policy can be tail drop so uh, the arriving packet itself will be dropped because there's no uh, empty place available in the queue another just scrap policy is based on priority we basically remove uh, the one with lowest priority from the queue and replace it with the uh, arrived uh, uh, with the packet that is uh, just arrived and the queue was full it couldn't get in so we remove the lowest priority uh, packet and replace it with the uh, newly arrived uh, packet uh, another uh, discard policy is a random policy which drops uh, some packets randomly from the queue and replace it with um, uh, the newly arrived packet besides first in first out uh, policy we have priority scheduling in which we divide or classify uh, the arrived packets into two or more different uh, classes and then each class will uh, uh, go into a different queue for example if you look at this uh, figure we have uh, two types of packets the green packet with lower quality and i'm sorry with lower priority and the red packet with higher priority uh, the red packets go to the high priority queue uh, the waiting area for uh, high priority packets and the green packets go to the low priority queue so two separate packet two separate queues and then uh, you know the uh, router will first try to empty the high priority queue and after the high priority queue is emptied and there is no other uh, high priority packet waiting to be forwarded to the uh, to their destination then uh, the router takes care of the low priority queue you can see uh, an example for example here uh, packets one come first then two then three uh, packet one and three are higher high priority packets so they will be taken care of first although two counts before three but three is um, served first and then after three uh, is forwarded and departed from the uh, queue then um, packet 2 is uh, you know served and then while packet 2 is uh, getting served packet 4 comes in packet 4 has a higher priority than packet 2 but uh, since the pa since packet 2 is already in service we don't uh, interrupt the service uh, for packet 2 because that will cause uh, some inefficiency for the network because uh, packet 2 is already in service so if we interrupt packet 2 and ask packet 4 to be um, served uh, meanwhile then uh, we are wasting a lot of bandwidth so this is called a, a priority scheduling that is uh, non-preemptive it's not preemptive because uh, you cannot interrupt an already uh, in service packet so after packet 2 is served and uh, departs from the router then it's time for packet 4 to count and serve 
to come and uh, uh, be, uh, be served by the uh, router and then uh, after some point for example here packet 5 which is a local priority packet arrives and uh, is served accordingly another scheduling policy is round robin scheduling uh, again similar to what we saw before uh, we have multiple classes um, for the sake of simplicity let's assume we have two classes and uh, for each class we have a separate queue uh, what router does is that first it uh, serves one packet from the for example uh, red queue and then after that it take care of one packet from the green uh, queue then it takes care of one packet from the red queue again then green then red then green if one queue is empty then you can um, uh, consecutively uh, take care of uh, more than one packet from uh, the non-empty queue uh, for example here you see one two three four and five arrives uh, in both uh, red and uh, green queues but uh, although uh, in the red queue we have uh, one and two but since green uh, queue has packet three uh, after one is served we have to take care of three because you cannot take care of uh, two packets uh, from the same queue uh, consecutively when there's some packet waiting in the other queue so after one you have to take care of three then you have to take care of two then after taking care of two uh, the green queue is empty there's no other packet so you can uh, consecutively take care of four after two although they're both in the same uh, queue uh, a more complicated scheduling policy is uh, to have a wait for each of the queues uh, and this is called the weighted fair queuing uh, basically uh, after you know the packets are arrived we classify them into different queues uh, in this case we have like a red queue green queue and a blue queue uh, and each queue has a different weight uh, so if you have a higher weight the queue um, the router has to spend uh, more time uh, taking care of that queue in a uh, proportional uh, manner if for example if w1 is uh, twice uh, as much as w2 you have to take care of uh, the you know key the red queue twice uh, more than the the green queue for example you have to uh, serve two packets from uh, red queue before taking care of one packet uh, in the green queue also as I said we need to have some policing mechanisms so that if uh, an end system wants to uh, misbehave uh, we don't allow that uh, for policing mechanisms we may have two different quantitative methods uh, for evaluating uh, the, 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 the amount of time that uh, one end system may take from the uh, router uh, one uh, quantitative uh, approach is to calculate uh, the average rate uh, the long-term average rate uh, which is equal to the number of packets that can be sent per uh, unit of time in a uh, long term and another uh, quantitative method is to uh, calculate the peak rate for every uh, application and doesn't let the peak rate to be uh, more than some uh, threshold and then we may have uh, some uh, we, we may have some restriction on the uh, birth side uh, which means the maximum number of packets that can be sent consecutively without uh, being interrupted here you can see an example of um, you know policing mechanism as you see uh, every uh, client or every you know end system uh, can only get r tokens per second uh, in a buffer that can hold up to b tokens uh, so uh, 
uh, for every packet that that client wants to send through the network he has to have um, uh, one uh, packet one sorry i'm sorry one token so this way you can uh, limit the number of uh, packets that the uh, end system can send through the network to r packets per second and then also you can uh, limit the burst size to only b packets uh, in a consecutive way without getting interrupted so here we can see uh, a weighted uh, fair queuing that we explained before for the scheduling process for the scheduling purpose and then this uh, token um, mechanism for policing uh, purposes so uh, this is the the, uh, the big picture of uh, what we have said so far about the scheduling and uh, policing mechanisms